I remember as I was growing up, my mum saying to me, goodness me, you know, you spend or you want to spend more money than I ever do or you want you know, nicer things than I did. You'll have to marry somebody that's wealthy enough for you to be able to do that. <laughs> as I was thinking about this show, I remembered those words. And I, I, I definitely remember, even as a child, thinking, no, I'm going to do that for myself. Hi, I'm Gabby Logan, and this is the II Family Money Show. In each episode, I speak to a familiar face about the role money has played in their family life and professional success. And this time, I'm joined by the formidable Dame Jane Ann Guardia. Widely regarded as one of Britain's most successful bankers, Dame Jane Ann helped Sir Richard Branson set up Virgin Money, and as CEO, steered the company through takeovers, a stock market float, and eventual sale. She currently chairs the HMRC board, and in 2020, launched Snoop, a money management app which is designed to help people become savvier with their spending and saving. Until last year, she was the government's Women in Finance champion and was made Dame in the 2019 Honours List. She met her husband Ashok during Freshers' Week at university and the couple have a daughter together. In our interview, Dame Jane Ann tells me how she didn't plan to have a career in finance at all when she was starting out, why she's always tried to make a positive difference wherever she's made big decisions in her working life and why her mum took charge of the family's money when she was a child. Well, Jane Anna, it is lovely to meet you and to chat on the Family Money Show. And the title, obviously, is really what it's all about. We want to know kind of where your education in terms of money kind of came from, what your family examples uh, were like, you know. So let's go back to when you were a child and how money was talked about in the home and were you aware of, you know, things like bills and mortgages and did your parents take out pensions was there a conversation about money yeah I mean money was always short so uh you know as you asked me to go back there I can always remember my mum worrying about my I don't remember my dad talking about it interestingly always my mum and uh, as I just say that you know uh, even today all around the world you hear that that um you know women are often the keepers of the the household purse if you like that was definitely the case in my childhood Um, And she was always concerned about money, um, both because of her own childhood, which had been quite, um, quite poor. um, And also because, um, you know, of of wanting to to live a a good life, or at least to to live a a life without debt is what my parents were always very keen to do, uh, as I was growing up. Um, And I remember being quite young, and we were going on holiday, and we used to go to a caravan down in South Wales. And for the year before, I'd always be saving up my pocket money, which I had, I can't remember how much, but a few pence a week. And I remember having, do you remember those uh, whiskey bottles and they had dimples in them with a net around them? You're probably not old enough to remember those. No, I do, yeah. And I remember my dad giving me one of those. I used to push pennies in and I remember having eight pounds to go uh, to spend on holiday and feeling that I was absolutely rich, counting it out. So, yeah, so money was tight and I was very well aware of the worth of it. Uh, They sound like they were good though at kind of making you realize you know the value of things and you know how important it was to to save and to make sure you've got money to pay the bills so that you know that they're all good lessons aren't they did they have investments did they talk about that or was there not enough to invest uh there was there was definitely not enough to invest um i mean i remember sadly both my mum and dad died back in 2016 within a few weeks of each other and i remember my mum died first and my dad was very poorly and um he was looking at the life insurance that they'd had, and it paid out. I can't remember how much. It wasn't a very large amount, but it, for my mum when she died, and he said, "Oh, look, that was that was a sensible thing to have done. That life insurance for all those years, because it did actually pay back when mum died." Um, and I, th- I was quite surprised, uh, you know, that that was one of the things that he'd looked at at that particular point in time. So they had a small amount of savings. I mean, they left twenty thousand pounds in total after, you know, a long life. So it was it wasn't enough to invest, but uh, certainly something that they were aware of and that they were they were looking after all the time. Um, what you do remind me of, which is very much a generational thing is I remember as I was growing up my mum saying to me goodness me you know you spend or you want to spend more money than I ever do or you want you know nicer things than I did you'll have to marry somebody that's wealthy enough for you to be able to do that (laughs) as I was thinking about this show I remembered those words and I, I, I definitely remember even as a child thinking no I'm going to do that for myself um, and you see that generational change yeah. that um, perhaps is more impactful on me than I'd realised. 
Yeah, well, I suppose she was only going on the examples that she'd had before. Exactly. And you were certainly not somebody that was going to sit around and wait for somebody else to provide for you, obviously. You yeah. did a history degree. Yeah. Um, and then you went into accountancy. So what, you obviously were kind of wanting to, you know, better yourself, go to university, make a life yourself. But you didn't go down the route of doing kind of, you know, um, any kind of financial degree or economics or something like that, which perhaps when I was looking into what you'd done in life, I thought maybe you'd have gone down that route. So were you following a passion when it came to history or were you thinking yeah. about a career afterwards? No, I mean, again, you know, if I, get, if I think about my background, uh, nobody in my family had ever been to university. And I think my, my parents were... Um, they call us, they call us, I'm the same, Jane, and they call us pioneers because I used to right? be the Chancellor of Leeds Trinity University, which has a very high percentage of pioneers. 94% of its intake at one point was Amazing. pioneers. Yeah, yeah. It is great, isn't it? And um, But I think, well, I don't know if it was the same for you then, but um, I realise now that, of course, we didn't really know what that sort of future was like then. So there mm. was a sort of, you know, my parents really, um, you know, struggled for me to have a good education. And at the end of that good education, sort of university was the thing that was held up as a good thing to do. But but I don't remember talking to my parents about a career or what to do next. Do you, do you know what I mean? It wasn't mm-hmm. there was no plan. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I think I, I happened to be good at, you know, I've always liked stories and history was part of that, I suppose. I did English history and French A-levels. Um, and I mainly liked the stories in all of them. And um, I think that, um, you know, I just followed that particular passion with no idea where it would lead. And then for me, having left uh, London University with a history degree, I was um, about to marry an Indian man, who is still my husband, I should point out. And, um, you know, we, we needed money. And so I was on the University of Milk Rand, interested in how I might actually earn some money. And accountancy was just one of those things that I fell into by accident and didn't enjoy it particularly. So I, I didn't... I didn't ever have any ambition to either make money or have a financial career. It, it sort of happened to me. <laughs> it was a secure place, though, I guess, accountancy, wasn't it? It's, it's, a, it's a steady eddy in that respect. You go into something that you kind of almost guaranteed that you can have some kind of career, but you didn't just stay on that treadmill, if you like. You then decided banking was the way forwards for you. And obviously, we know the incredible things you've done in banking. So tell me how that, that move happened and what drew you into a different financial sector. Um, well, I mean, when I tell these stories, I, I'm, I have to apologise to everybody that it is all a sort of connection of collection and connection of, of accidents along the way. So I did. So go, many great careers are. <laughs> well, and I think sometimes, you know, if you open yourself up to life and let things happen, you know, good good things perhaps do happen. Would I, if I knew everything I know now and started out again, would I do the same thing? Who knows? But anyway. I started off, as you say, in accountancy because it was a good place to start. It paid, I remember ever so clearly, £4,250 a year when I started, uh, which doesn't make me seem like a relic, but it it was back in the 80s. Um, I was introduced to a world that I had never seen before, which was the business world, because I joined um, what was then Ernst & Winnie, now EY, and as an auditor, which meant I went to see all sorts of other businesses. And the thing that I discovered, and I think this is partly to do with, um, you know, liking stories, was that I didn't really like the numbers, but I liked the people. And I'd spend an awful lot of time um, what with what we now call networking, although I didn't realise that's what I was doing at the time, <laughs> you know, just chatting to people about yeah. their lives and their work. And, and I really enjoyed that. And thinking in the end, how could... How did numbers help to tell a story, I think, is something that I've always been really interested in. Um, How did I become a banker? Well, you know, I sort of followed the accident of my career continually um, throughout those years. I qualified as an accountant, went to what is now called Aviva, which was a big client of of EY's at the time, joined there as an accountant, um, was discovered to be quite a good project manager, which is probably, if if I'm good at anything, that's the thing that would define me I think I can you know take a take a a complicated box of problems and sort them out into some sort of order Um, and as a consequence Nora Junior asked me to do that it was quite successful and then they said to me right we would like you now to decide what it is you'd like to do next you can be really creative and tell us where you think you would like to take the business next and I, I had no idea and by complete accident I met someone who had just the week before met Richard Branson and um we were chatting about how exciting it would be to work for Richard Branson. And uh, he came up with the idea of launching a financial services business with what was then Norwich Union. 
Um, and that became an investment business, actually, rather than a bank called Virgin Direct. And uh, it was a super exciting time. Again, it was all for me, the excitement wasn't really about the numbers. It was about the people and the adventure that we could have in setting up the business and how we could help customers to have things that they'd never had before. You know, it was. And how involved was Richard Branson at that time? And how involved were you with him? Um, uh, Well, he was very much involved in the sort of creative thought, if that's the right way of putting it, but not in running the business day to day. Um, So was he the big, the big, the big kind of picture? Did he have definitely good strategy? And and very much, very much the sort of um, customer conscience. So as I remember ever so clearly, as we were thinking about, we, we, we launched a product which was really a precursor of what is today known as an ISA. It was called a personal equity plan then or a PEP. And um, what that did was um, it enabled people with much smaller amounts of money available for investment to invest and over the telephone rather than having to go in to see an advisor and do it quite straight in a straightforward and simple manner. Um, and it's hard to remember that that hadn't happened before. You know, it was quite mm. groundbreaking mm. to enable people to invest in that way. Um, just, to, just to put it into a historical context, had things changed in the law? What, what do you think the, what was the climate of investment like or what was happening politically that was allowing this kind of shift in the way people were investing? Well, um, two, two things, I, I think, perhaps three things that I, I would say. So it's a really good point that I haven't thought of for years. I think, first of all, the government were wanting to encourage people more broadly to save. And so they were thinking of tax advantageous schemes in order to help that. So if, like with an ISA today, you know, if you were to invest in a personal equities plan, you could do that with your, um, with your gains being, and your income being tax free. And that was something that was really appealing to people. And I couldn't tell you it was brand new, but it was certainly heightened and the government were supporting that sort of um, that sort of advertisement, really, of uh, mm. a good way to save. So, so that was the first thing. The second thing was that um, Direct Line had launched their telephone li- uh, car insurance, mm. and that had been to great fanfare, and it was hugely innovative. I mean, don't forget, this was pre-internet, which, again, <laughs> makes me feel older than I feel I should be. And um, we felt at Virgin that um, this is something that we could really build on, that – investment didn't have to be difficult and if you could make it simple enough to do over the telephone then that would be something that everybody would feel comfortable with Mm -hmm. Um, and so that was I think a sort of socio-economic change of the time that we were able Mm -hmm. to take advantage of Um, and then the third thing was that uh, the person that I'd met in meeting Richard Branson um, someone called Rowan Gormley who subsequently went on to run Virgin Wines and Majestic Wines um, was undoubtedly the most creative person I'd ever met, and he and I set up this business together. And he, where he was a South Af- he's, he's a South African, and would always challenge the status quo and say, "Why, why on earth do we do things like this?" And I'd never, because of my background, probably I'd I'd never properly realised in a sort of personal way that individuals can change the way things are. Mm-hmm. And so those three things sort of came together, I think, us wanting to do things differently. The fact that you could do, you could use the telephone and direct line had proved that to mm-hmm. access a broader group of people than financial services businesses had before and the government were encouraging these savings. And so that was where uh, Virgin Direct came from. And I, I think... Rowan was undoubtedly more of a creative influence than Richard Branson, but once Richard really understood that benefit, he got right behind it. And I remember in particular his interventions were always about pricing. Let's do this as um, cheaply, really, as we can Mm. for the customer. Let's give the customer a really great deal. And so um, it was a very, um, from a business point of view, a very sort of deep um, change to find a massive shift yeah. a really big shift and you were at the vanguard of that which now you know especially for, for an audience listening to this a younger audience <laughs> it's it's so easy as you say there to forget that that's not the way things have always been you know we're, we're talking now on a platform that is interactive investor yeah. that is you know you can go on an app and make investments and do you know and sort your financial future out or your planning for your financial future through through that kind of medium you don't even have to speak to anybody if you don't want to but obviously in those days people had to make appointments go down to the high street you know um, and yeah. it was quite a laborious process you know form filling these days feels like an anathema doesn't it, it compared really to yeah. you know what we had to do and so we're talking 1995 here, so not, you know, essentially. No, not long ago, yeah. Things have moved on in, in some ways. And our expectations. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and just to build on that, if I can, Gabby, just a little bit. Um, that business, that part of the business was quite successful. And then we launched um, a partnership which enabled us to offer mortgages to people. And the mortgage that we offered was called the Virgin One Account. And the thing that I think if I look back over my career, the, the biggest change we made actually probably wasn't the one we've just described. We looked at the Virgin One Account, we looked at the mortgage market. And at that time, Mortgage interest was calculated on a monthly basis, not on a daily basis. So you'd have your outstanding mortgage balance for the month. Let's say it was £100,000. You'd pay interest on £100,000 for each of 30 days, if you see what I mean. Mm-hmm. And you weren't allowed to reduce the balance largely during that month. And we said we thought that that was unfair for customers and that we would uh, only calculate uh, mortgage interest on a daily basis. So if customers started to pay off their mortgage, they'd get correspondingly a lesser interest. The benefit would be immediate. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, And now it's unheard of for any mortgage not to be paid on a daily basis. And I think... Revolutionary. Well, the thing I'm really pleased about with that, and I mean, we probably didn't anticipate it at the time, but it must have saved mortgage payers in the UK hundreds of millions of pounds since we launched mm-hmm. the Virgin One account. So I feel quite good about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, 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 that's, and it's, that's what, that's what it's, moving into banking really. It's the excitement yeah. of those changes that, that move things forward, I think, rather than banking in itself. Yeah, and that's interesting because actually I was going to ask you then about you went to a kind of more traditional setup, I guess, at RBS and in a more traditional environment. And we we would consider a banking environment because what Richard Branson was doing, as he does with all of his businesses, is try to kind of rip up the, you know, the model, reinvent the wheel in the industry and see if it can be done a different way. Um, What was that experience like then going into something that was a lot more traditional? Well, I mean, so the reason that I went to RBS wasn't that I chose to join the bank, if you like. It was that they bought the Virgin One account. They'd been the initial partners in it. Uh, They owned 51%, I think, of the business. And then they bought the rest from Richard Branson. And so I and all of my team became a Virgin branded company, 100% owned by RBS. I moved to Scotland and became, uh, for six years, ingrained in that sort of uh, RBS team. Uh, left in October 2006 and had, as I say, about, I think it was about six years there. Um, And uh, for me, in terms of the stage of my life, I guess, it worked extremely well because I had a baby at that point and it was a a more settled environment than the the huge entrepreneurial excitement of of the Virgin Group, if you like. Um, But I learned a lot. It was um, equally exciting, much more difficult uh, the challenges were real. I mean, I, I t- I've told this story before, but the one that comes to mind as we're thinking about it is I was running um, some of the loan, personal loan businesses for RBS, and it was very clear to us that we could only make money from selling loans if, um, what do you call it, personal protection insurance, PPI, was attached to that loan. And I remember going to see somebody extremely senior at the bank and saying, this can't be right. This isn't sustainable. I mean, I genuinely promise you, I absolutely did it before the crisis happened. And this person saying to me, well, we all know that it's wrong, but we can't be the first bank to pull away from it because it'll affect our share price. And it was a real dawning for me that um, the way in which products and the consumer were thought about in some of these listed businesses wasn't driven by customer benefit it was definitely driven by what was perceived to be shareholder benefit of course it turned out to be a disaster for shareholders in the end Uh, and I think it was that that made me realize goodness you know we've got to do something that means that we can make a positive difference to the world not just look at the share price Um, Mm -hmm. and that's always been very important for me. Um, before we move on to you going back into the slightly more entrepreneurial kind of world of Virgin, um, you mentioned there you had a baby um, and you, you've got one daughter. That's right, you? yeah. Yeah, yeah. How did becoming a mum change your working mindset? Because you you left it a little bit later, didn't you, to start your family? I think Too I've late. Read that you, well, you um, said you wish I, in a way you'd kind of got yeah. on with it a bit sooner. And I, it's probably easier for me to answer the question now that my daughter's nearly 20 than it would have been when she was 12, if you know what I mean, because... Uh, and uh, she groans every time I say this as well, a number of your listeners, but I definitely make the point to her that for me, when I look back over my life, the the most important thing is undoubtedly family. I've had a mm-hmm. wonderful work life, but, you know, it's it has been at the cost of family in some ways. I, I was Because we're doing some renovations in our house, I opened a box over the weekend, which had some of my parents' old papers in them. 
and um, uh, one of them was a, um, a press um, cutting of the um, notification that they'd put in a local paper of the birth of my daughter. And it said, um, you know, first grandchild of Gwen and Jeff. And it made me cry at the weekend because, of course, she became their only grand. She was their only grandchild. Mm -hmm. And that was really a sacrifice that came because of my commitment to work. And mm -hmm. you know, I think that it's really important that as human beings, men and women, we try and get what we've always referred to as work-life balance really right. And so mm -hmm. I do say to my daughter, think about, it, you know, as you move forward, it's great that you're having this education. You've got all the world ahead of you and, you know, you've got a much more equal uh, opportunity that lies ahead of you but don't sacrifice the really brilliant things in life which in my mind are looking uh, having a family looking after a family and I'm guessing Jane Ann that at that point uh, when you were working out when was the right time to have a family a lot of your male colleagues of a similar age were probably popping children out left right and center oh, sure. yes absolutely right of course and so I didn't we didn't start even trying to have a family till I was 35 um, and uh, our daughter arrived when I was 41 after nine miscarriages, six bouts of IVF, <laughs> had six bouts of IVF after she arrived and still no other child. And so, you know, you do, I think, put yourself through a lot of um, uh, challenges as a, mm. as a woman at work, unless you, unless you get your priorities. Is I'm, it better? Do you through. think the environment that you see now, is it better? Um, I, I hope it's better. I mean, I, um, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. You know, I talked to some of my daughter's friends who are 20 and they talk about, you know, well, um, maybe we should freeze our eggs. And this isn't a conversation that I've, um, enlisted, uh, you know, I've encouraged. I think it's really good that young women today have got that opportunity and are thinking about that sort of thing to, you know, while they're young and fertile, mm. um, you know, having the opportunity to think about their futures perhaps in the way that would never, certainly would never have occurred to me. Um, I mean, I think that the reason that it's slightly better is that we have the conversation, we've got the role models, we've got the experience. And I think, um, you know, both male and female bosses at work are much more immediately um, open to being supportive of maternity leave and all of the, that involves. Um, I'm not sure that the emotional journey are you of um, being a mum and being at work will ever change. <laughs> no, no. Um, so I think that, um, I mean, it, the, the way in which being a mum in the end really changed my life, my work life, was that I'd assumed at 41, you know, that I knew what I was doing, that a baby would arrive, that I'd attach her to my hip sort of thing and carry on with work and everything else as um, I'd intended. My husband gave up work and I was going to carry on because I was the main breadwinner. Um, and then, of course, the day she was born, I realised I didn't want to go back to work and <laughs> I did want to be a mum. And I remember because, I, ha you know, we'd made all of those commitments um, which made that impossible. And I remember when I did go back to work after a ridiculously short period of time, of 10 weeks or something, um, I remember having a uh, doing a sort of stand-up uh, at work at Virgin and saying, I was obviously, you know, still full of hormones and emotions by, as I repeat this story, I can tell you. And uh, saying to people, do you, do you know, um, I don't want to come back to work just to make profit for somebody else or just to, you know, get processes right. If, we're, if I'm going to have to give up time with my child, I, I really want to try and make a difference. And, and when I finished speaking and I looked up, because I'd obviously internalised all of this even as I think about it, there were people in the room all in tears and I thought, you know what, this isn't just me. No. This, is, this is how everyone feels about having to juggle um, work and family and I think it's so I, I think the practical side of things are definitely better and I think you know there's still a, a an emotional challenge for us all probably some people do it better than I did <laughs> so just going back to you leaving RBS and going back into the Virgin uh, family I, I guess culture was really important in terms of your decision making oh, at yes. that point and and I, I presume you <laughs> could have gone to many different places to work you could have done lots of different things and people were wanting you so how do you you know when you're um faced with choices like that what was what was the driver the main motivator well it, no, well I don't know whether people wanted me or not but the good thing was Richard Branson did <laughs> so um and so well, he's the driver then he's the motivator he must he, there's something about him that that lured you back well so what had happened was um 
the, uh, when RBS had bought the Virgin One account, this mortgage business, Richard had written to me, and I, I really regret, I can't find the letter because it would have been a really good one to have kept, but uh, a handwritten letter, and he said, I'm quite worried about selling you and, and the team to RBS. If ever you decide you don't like corporate life, give me a ring because we'd love to have you back. Right, And that was literally when we were celebrating the fact that we'd sold the business to a big corporate. And I thought... That's really nice, Richard, but I'm sure that won't ever be necessary. <laughs> Turned out that he had a crystal ball. And um, by 2000, so this was six years later, and I'd kept vaguely in touch with the Virgin guys and Richard, but not, you know, tightly in touch. Um, but definitely culture was changing at RBS. It had been super successful. It had acquired the NatWest Bank um, and... Uh, you know, there were all sorts of business cases. Harvard did a review of RBS saying that it was the best bank in the world. In fact, at one point, I think it was the biggest bank in the world. And all of that success created an environment that was hubristic at best, probably, and probably just uh, a little bit gung-ho mm -hmm. uh, at worst. Mm -hmm. And two members of my team who'd been with me at Virgin and funny enough are still with me at Snoop but nevertheless the two, two of them Dave and Paul walked into my room at RBS one Thursday morning and said haven't you had enough of this because we all have um you remember Richard wrote that letter saying come back if you don't like corporate life why don't you give him a ring and I rang him on the Thursday afternoon and He'd asked me to go to London to see some of the team on the Tuesday. And by the end of the following week, it was agreed that, you know, we'd had to manage the legals and everything, but let's go back. And so there wasn't that sort of choice in the sense. It was simply following up on a promise that had been made several years earlier. And it just felt so right. Of course, we then went back. I took 82 people back to Virgin Money, as it was then. It was already called Virgin Money then, that's right, with me. Um, in It would have been something like May 2007, I think. And we were going to relaunch the Virgin One account. Um, but by July 2007, it became clear that the financial markets were closing down. And the bank, Macquarie Bank, that was going to be supporting us, um, rang to say, we don't think we can do this anymore. And so I'd got this sort of weight of all of the people that I'd that had left RBS with me to go to Virgin um without a plan uh, and that was I remember my my mum at the time that I left RBS saying what on earth are you doing you know you've you're leaving this big blue chip company to go to this tiny little business you sure it's the right thing to do and you know initially when the market started to close it felt like a very bad decision but um, but with hindsight were you glad you got out of RBS before things really did turn Oh, goodness me. Yeah, been, I mean, it, I mean, timing is everything. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it might not have been ideal and perfect when you, you know, where you were going to because of what was going on. But surely, yeah, being out, out of that mess uh, well, must have felt enormous relief. Uh, yes, for, definitely for sure. Um, but, of course, back in 2000, I remember actually seeing Fred Goodwin um, about, it would have been about summer 2007, and saying to him, you know, goodness me, um, I joined just uh, joined RBS just after you'd bought NatWest and I left just before you bought AB and AMRO. Uh, and he actually said to me, your timing might have been perfect, Jane Ann, and it did feel quite like that. <laughs> so, um, and then I think, you know, having gone to Virgin and got to this place where the pressure is huge because you've got so much external uh, challenge to deal with and I've brought all of these people with me and there were people already at Virgin of course and I think that um, you know like so many things in life if things are too easy it, you know you don't, there's nothing to force you to be creative or different mm -hmm. is there and I think mm -hmm. it forced us to think gosh well if plan A isn't going to happen because the banks can't support us then we have to find a plan B and for us um, plan B turned out to be super high profile and something that um, I learned more from than I've learned from anything in my life. And that was, we saw the queues forming outside Northern Rock in 2008 when they, when they collapsed. I mean, we thought it was a bank collapse, but of course it was really the beginning of the financial crisis. Um, and Virgin Money became the government's preferred bidder to acquire that business. And so to your question that I meant to answer a very long time ago, that's how I became a banker. <laughs> <laughs> It's just so, I, what I love about your story though, as you said at the very beginning, there wasn't really a plan. 
<laughs> to you know to head up um, a revolutionary bank or to you know to be part of one of the biggest banks in the world it, it was about people it was about uh, understanding relationships and being you know kind of conscious of what the, the customer wanted and putting that to the forefront of your your thinking but also it seems aligning yourself or, or not being afraid to say this this person's brilliant he's creative I really want to be around and, and, and be in his environment and the things that I can offer them you know perhaps they haven't got in their skill set which you clearly complemented each other very well what is it about Richard Branson if you could kind of distill it down you know to, to anybody listening who's not met him doesn't you know doesn't know him as well as you do what is it about him that has allowed him to do this from the very beginning of his life really with the first of all with the record industry you know and through whether it's travel planes <laughs> trains you know space travel uh, what is it about him well i think uh, what he would say is um he, he wrote a book and the title of it was screw it let's do it i don't know if you've come across that and in the virgin group we actually had notepads with that written on it and and i think that I don't know whether you'd actually say that's his mantra for business life, but it certainly felt like it to us. You know, let's just do it. Uh, so he's a, definitely a risk taker. And, uh, and you know, you saw that particularly when he was younger in his personal life, obviously. And I think that what I've found as I've got older is um, taking um, appropriate risk, particularly in a bank, <laughs> but taking business risk. Um, is really important. You can really push the boundaries to do new things, to be creative, to offer customers better things. But you've always got the establishment detractors. And I think that that is the limitation of business. Now, as an entrepreneur, I think you're pushing against established ways of thinking. I think as a woman, I'm afraid in particular, I, I used not to like to think this was true, but in hindsight, I think it is and continues to be. I think it's even harder to stand against the norm. I think, you know, you can be, you, people put you down a lot. I found that. And I think that because Richard has been so successful, people have found, you know, you, you know that he gets criticised actually himself yeah. for all of this. But his success speaks for itself and his ability to front that success in, you know, um, in a dramatic um, uh, extrovert PR sensitive sort of way has has helped him enormously not very few people have that I think and mm. so from my perspective I think I'm um, I, I learned to be a sort of similar character in terms of pushing the boundaries did you become more risky were you ever um, more risk averse and did he did he kind of release that in you yeah oh definitely I mean mm. I think if I look at my time at Virgin Money as a banker I'd say the thing I regret most is that I don't think I took enough risk in the bank. So I think it was, a, you know, it was, I was very mindful of it being a very safe bank. We bought Northern Rock and so, you know, and I'd been at RBS. So both of those things tend to affect the way in which you think about things. So the bank itself is always very low risk. But what I mean by risk is, you know, take on different people and mm. try different things and mm. don't be afraid to fail and, you know, um, do make audacious takeover bids <laughs> if you can afford <laughs> to do it, you know, and, and tell your story with excitement and pride and confidence. All of those things are actually not that normal when you go to an established corporate that's listed on the FTSE 100. And what about your personal investments over the years? Um, would they look, if I looked at those, would they look quite risky or are they quite safe? They're quite safe too, although, you know, I don't think about that very much. So I, so... Um, so who does it? Is it you or your husband? Who's in charge of making sure that? Uh, my husband, really. Right. <laughs> um, I mean, we, you know, we're, we've done much better than my than I would have imagined when I started off saving my eight pounds in a whiskey dimple bottle, but not, you know, not to an extent where we're. I consider ourselves high flying investors <laughs> by any means. Um, and so um, we have a small investment portfolio that is managed by our bank. And, you know, we look at it, I don't know, twice a year perhaps and see how that's gone. We always have ICES. Um, but the, the most significant and, if you like, risky investment, I suppose, that we've done is to set up my business, Snoop. Um, you know, to, to start your own business and put your own money into that is, all, you know, however confident you are about success and it's doing really well, obviously it's, that's quite a significant risk to take. I want to learn more about Snoop, but just going back on the on the investments, it's really interesting that you 
Um, and I imagine it's a practical thing and to do with time, because you mentioned that your husband left work to help run the family when you, you were the, the main breadwinner. Um, most of the male guests on this podcast have absolutely no idea what's going on with personal family investments and the, and their wives look after things. And so I was sure that you were going to tell me that you were the one that did it. And it's, I, I think it must just be a practical thing. The person that is the busiest, obviously, passes that job on to the person that's uh, perhaps got a bit more time. Yeah. Is that how, how it was, really? Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, broadly, with, for me and my husband, when uh, our daughter came along, I he, he did the sort of home admin, if you like, and I did the work admin, if that's the right way of looking at it. And I think that's just carried on. And he happens to be very good at it. And uh, the thing that I always find he's so much better at than me is that if I say, oh, do you remember that, well, you know, something that from an investment point of view or from a, an admin point of view we did, you know, five years ago or something, you can always bring up the email or the piece of paper or whatever. And I'm, I'm not that organised, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but you obviously I- have... Uh, along the way, we, right from the beginning, from the EY days, were you making sure that you took out pensions and that you had ISAs even in the yeah. early days? Yes. Um, and I think, in a, so shockingly, um, we turned 60 uh, at the end of last I turned 60 at the end of last year, my husband the year before. And I started to get letters from pension companies. I mean, I couldn't believe I was getting the letters. Yeah, who are they and, sending these to? <laughs> well, why do you need to, six months before your 60th birthday, these pension companies write to you and go, you, know, to, you need to decide what you're going to do in six months' time. And it, even though I've done everything that I've done in financial services, m- many years ago w- when we were setting up Virgin, I remember we were t- t- actually building the process for this personal equity plan ISA thing. And I'd go into the office and really think about it from a banking or financial services point of view. And then I remember going home one weekend and some stuff, literally stuff, arrived in the post from Barclays. And my husband and I were sat at the kitchen table and I opened the envelope and it was about a similar sort of investment product. And I realised I consumed it so much differently as a normal person sat at home at the kitchen table than I was as a CEO of a financial services company trying to design the process, if you see what I mean. Yeah. We always said we must do the kitchen table test. We must make sure it works for normal people in a home environment, not just as, you know, Mm. bankers, if you like, sat in the office. And pensions feels exactly the same to me that, you know, you can talk, I think people in financial services can talk about pensions till they're blue in the face but until you're at home and you're nearing retirement age and you're thinking thank god I actually did invest in that do you realize properly how important it is and so you know if I could give any message to anyone that's listening to this that's much younger than me it's I think in your 20s and 30s you think why on earth should I bother with a pension I've got so much to spend my money on and you know that's years and years away And the fact, I'm sorry to sound like an old duffer, is that those years go so fast that you're very pleased that you managed to find some, you know, pounds or pence or whatever it is to put away in your pension in the end because it's always worth it. And so if I had any investment advice to anybody, it would be definitely make sure you put as much as you can in your pension. I'm fairly sure, Jane Ann, that that will be cut out and used as the advert for the whole series. <laughs> never mind, never mind the uh, <laughs> this episode, um, especially coming from you. I think you know it's got a huge weight, carries enormous weight. Um, so tell us a little bit about Snoop then, and where that idea came from, and and what Snoop you hope will become and and do for people's lives. So particularly in these times of, um, you know, when um, consumer spending is so difficult and the cost of living is so high, what we hope Snoop will do is to help people to manage their money, to save every penny and to take advantage of everything that they can to live a a sound financial life. Um, It came from the fact that uh, in at the end of 2018, Virgin Money was sold to the Clydesdale Bank and um, which was quite traumatic, actually, for those of us that had set it up from nothing at the very beginning. It's sort of a, it's one of those things again, which is a intellectual celebration and an emotional bereavement, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, and um, again, the bereavement is as much as anything to do with the purpose of the business and the people that are there, as it is, you know, selling the balance sheet. Nobody's that worried about. But um, at, at the end, of, by the end of 2018, uh, the Virgin Money team had been—we'd been, we'd been um, in the midst of creating a new digital bank, 
And we were working with Anton Jenkins, who used to um, run Barclays uh, a number of years ago, set up a, a tech company that develops new bank tech. And we were planning to be the, the next and best, we hoped, Monzo or Starling or whatever. Um, but of course, the Clydesdale bought Virgin Money. They already had digital capability. And so they decided they'd close down the new development that was the Virgin Money Digital Bank and make all of the team redundant. And so... Um, that team came to see me and said, look, you know, we've done so much thinking about the new ways of banking and um, to your earlier point, you know, what were the, uh, what, what was the sort of regulatory uh, background to this? There's a new way of people thinking about their banking. It's called open banking, which enables people to aggregate all of their different bank accounts in one place. You know, why don't we use our experience, um, the fact that we've worked together before this new regulatory environment to really help people and to create something that can help people save money? And so um, uh, it was interesting. One of a, a friend of mine who was an investment banker and advised me for many years, not very many months ago, said to me, when it was announced, Jane Ann, that you were going to set up Snoop with the old team to be built on new regulatory platform and do it with your own money. I thought she has gone completely and utterly mad. <laughs> and, it, and it did feel a little bit like it at the time. You know, goodness me, we've built all the way up to selling a, you know, creating a bank and selling it to the Clydesdale. And now we've literally gone back to go, have not collected £200. And here we go again. <laughs> and, you know, I'm going to put my own money into starting this off um, to begin with. And it has been an absolutely fabulous thing to do. So we are almost exactly two years since we launched, actually. It was April the 17th, 2020, that we went live. At the beginning of a global pandemic, why yes, not? absolutely. Well, and we did it because of customer feedback, actually. Mm. So we'd, had, um, we'd gone live in beta um, in January 2020 and got 5,000 customers. And they'd said, when the pandemic started, you've got to get this out there because it's going to be really helpful for people through these difficult times. Mm. Um, and since then, we've had well over three quarters of a million downloads. Um, you know, it's, people are using us. The, the data says more than online banking customers use First Direct, which is fantastic. Um, and we're saving people. We aim to save people around £1,500 a year. And, and that's really important in these very difficult times, of course. So... Um, uh, yeah, it's grown. We've got about 50 people now and um, it's uh, a business we're very proud of. And you mentioned getting those letters telling you, you know, that you're turning 60 and your pension, uh, how it's performing and what you want to do with it. Is this, do you see this as your final big project or can you ever see a time when you would slow down and stop turning your ideas into reality? And there's no reason why you should ever stop. No, I, I mean, I can't see that. I think, um, I don't think that's an age thing. I think it's an ideas thing, mm -hmm. if you see what I mean. And the wonderful thing about Snoop is when I ran Virgin Money, the, one of the problems of running a bank is it's sort of limited by what it is, if you see what I mean. So a bank offers savings and mortgages and credit cards and current accounts broadly. And <laughs> It's hard to innovate beyond that. Really, really difficult for banks to innovate. You know, and there's been some innovation brought in, as you know, from the likes of Klarna with Buy Now, Pay Later, and the banks are trying to emulate that. But, but nevertheless, in the end, it's about people borrowing and saving money, I think, in banking. The thing about Snoop is that um, the opportunity to develop it and extend it seems to be endless. There's endless ways of helping people in all sorts of different financial categories and beyond, really, with mm. you know, helping people to improve their lives if that's what they want to do. Um, and so I can see really developing Snoop being something that gets pretty consume, all consuming over time. But within that, there are also other opportunities to develop new businesses off, not necessarily off the back of it, alongside it. Um, and I think while those opportunities are there, then I'll be there too, I hope. And finally, um, you've talked about your daughter and the kind of environment she's growing up in, very different to the one, and she's got different uh, opportunities to, to those that you had. Have you given her, do you think, at 20 years old, enough financial education that she'll be able to make good decisions about her own financial planning or future? Or is she is she not that interested at the moment? And are you ready to, to, to jump in? She, she's definitely interested. Um, I mean, like all uh, late teenagers, probably she's she went through a phase of um, if I'd have said let's do this or that, it would have definitely not been the right thing to do. And she's more interested now than she was before. Um, she 
So two things that she said. First of all, she's interested in ISIS. Apparently, you know, people are talking in her age group are talking about ISIS being good because they're tax effective. I was surprised mm-hmm. about that and yeah. encourage her to put some savings in there. But it was really interesting. Yesterday, I, um, I I think I said earlier that I found something from my parents. I'd, I'd opened a box that I hadn't opened since they died. This sounds um, like a, a marvellous box of memories, this well, box. Well, yes, absolutely. And uh, in, in the box, and I, I should wave it to you here, was my dad's war- wallet. And in the wallet was 70 quid in Scottish notes because we lived in Edinburgh at the time that they died. And so I, I gave it to Amy and I said, spend it wisely darling because uh, this is like an easter present by surprise from granddad and she said i'm going to put it in my uh, to be honest my, my nationwide savings account and i thought and uh, and the reason was i said to her you know will you be able to spend the scottish money down here and she said well i'm not going to worry about that i'll just take it to the nationwide and put it in my nationwide savings account and i and it did just um strike me as i think if i if 70 quid had come my way when i was 19 by surprise mm. I think I'd have thought about going to the pub or something. Yeah. <laughs> She's... I didn't say it to her at the time, but I was quite impressed that she said, I'm going to put it in my savings account. Maybe if I'd have given it, given her 20 quid or something, she'd have gone down the pub. But I think because it came from Grandad, she wants to keep it for a longer time. Thanks for listening. If you've got time, please like and follow the II Family Money Show and leave us a review or rating in your podcast app. You can find loads of ideas on how to plan for you and your family's financial future at ii.co.uk. I'll see you next time.